back to that one. So one of the things you can think about is uh, these 19 null plots are only a finite set. So this is one difference from classical hypothesis testing. Um, in classical hypothesis, we have a full distribution and we have a range. Um, by asking people to evaluate graphics, we don't, can't ask them to evaluate a thousand plots. So we have a finite sample from the null distribution. So we can think about <coughs> that we've got some draws from a null distribution. And we may not have pre-specified that distribution ahead of time. In this case, basically I've got um, this drawer corresponds to that sample from the null. And this one corresponds to that one. And so on. Alrighty, so one of the differences is I'm making comparison just on a finite sample from that null distribution. That can create some complications. Right, <coughs> and so in general with graphics, we don't really have a quantification of what that null distribution is, but we may be able to specify a process to draw from a null distribution. Um, so all we have, we don't have this guy, we just have M minus one representatives from whatever we see. So we just have a whole set of, sort of these ones. Okay, so then how do we put some components um, that quantify the result? We actually can calculate a p-value for it. So in a simple setting, when I only have one person evaluating the lineup, um, the probability that by chance they pick the data plot is 1 over m, right? So that that's both my sort of type 1 error and kind of my p-value in 1 if I've only got one observer. Sorry. Right? So if I have m plots in the lineup, I've been looking at m equals 20, then I have a 1 in m chance of picking that plot by chance, picking the data plot by chance. If you bring in multiple observers, each one acting independently, so not in a room like this where you could be talking to each other, but if you have multiple observers, um, then you estimate the p-value using a binomial distribution. And so you calculate um, the probability of observing x number of observers um, picking the data plot. Right. And um, we have a total of k observers. So we're looking at um, the number that pick the observed data plot, and each one has a probability of 1 on m, and so we can get at the p-value using a binomial. I should say. All right, and this is in a paper by um, Majumda that's coming out at the end of this year, the next JASA paper. All right, so this is time to back up a sec a little bit. Um, one of the things that you still see from time to time um, is that uh, people will see a pattern in the data and then test specifically for that pattern. I don't know whether any of you have seen that happen before, but suppose um, a probably a common scenario would be that uh, people do a cluster analysis of their data and then follow up with the test of differences between the means of the clusters. Um, it happens more often than I, I would expect it to happen. That p-value that you get from testing the means being different is completely invalid, right? It's not correct because you already see that structure in the data and so the probability that, that actually occurred in the data is 
is closer actually to one than the p-value that you would get from the testing. Um, that's called post hoc testing and it doesn't help you infer to the future. It doesn't help you infer that those are present in future data. So it's the, I, I think the best way of explaining that the problem with that type of testing is if you were flipping a coin, right? You flip a coin heads or tails. Before you flip the coin, what's the probability of a head? A half if the coin is fair, right? After you flip the coin, what's the probability of a head? Yeah, one or zero. It either happened or it didn't happen. All right, so post hoc testing, when you find a structure in the data and test specifically for that, the p values are not correct. That's different. So we already, by making a plot, we haven't looked at the data, or the observer hasn't looked at the data, and so the p values are valid p values. And so we really can test for significance of structure. So um, just be aware of post hoc testing. All right, next thing is the power. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, that's a bad shirt. Okay, so one of the other things that we like to know about statistical tests is how powerful they are. So um, whether to use uh, a t-test or a test of the medians, using medians, a robust statistic. Typically, the t-test is more um, powerful than a test using medians, but the medians is more flexible. Right? But generally, a way to evaluate um, how good a test is, is by its power. So in, and, and power means that if the null hypothesis is wrong, if I get this right, um, will I detect it? So the probability of uh, rejecting if the null hypothesis really is wrong. Right, so it's the flip side to type 1 error. So you want to know if, if the null hypothesis is wrong that you do have a good chance of detecting that, and that's the power of the test. Alrighty, so we also um, can get some sense of that by combining the results from multiple observers. So essentially the number of people that observe the data plot, or identify the data plot, gives us some sense of the signal strength, which is sort of equivalent to power. All right, and uh, this actually has been used to make some comparison between different plot types. So you have choices in how you design your plot. Um, if you show people lineups with one plot design, or lineups with another plot design, Sometimes they're better at detecting the observed data with one design than another. And that's analogous to power. And it also helps us decide which is the best way to make design a plot. Too. Okay. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to do a few lineups. And in each of these, I'm going to run this through um, R, actually. I'm going to use the Nullabor package. Let's see if I can do this. Right, so I'm using the Nullable package. And I'm going to use the Mexico City data. Technically, uh, we have, you have looked at this data, so technically you're not valid observers, although we haven't specifically looked at these plots, I think. So your job is to pick one of these that's different from the others. Um, sorry, and I've got, 
well, I could tell you the variables, nitrous oxide and um, mortality. Is any of these different from the others? What do you say? Six? Who says six? Anybody say something different? Seventeen? Okay. Anybody say something else? Eleven? Okay, so if you said six, why do you say six? So you're looking at that relationship already. If you said 17, why did you pick 17? Because why? Uh, there's a split. If you said 11, why did you say 11? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that actually that's a common mistake. That we find that people read the number above. We need, maybe need more gap between them. Okay, how do we check um, which is the correct answer? The nullipore package allows you to be the observer by, de by encrypting the correct position. And so to decrypt it, we need to run this one. And yeah, the true, p true plot was in position six. Um, the fact that a lot of you picked that, our p-value would be really minuscule. So if we ran the calculations, the p-value would be really tiny, um, which says that that relationship between NOx and mortality is very strong. Actually, you can pick it out of the lineup. I should say, um, we should have backed up for a sec to Um, all of the, I should have explained how the null plots were created. Um, one of the primary mechanisms that we use for creating the null plots is permutation. And so if I have two columns of numbers like this, I take one of those columns and I sample that column, which means I, I scramble the values. So if there is association between the two variables, that's broken. Right. So all of these null plots were generated by taking one of the columns and just scrambling this relationship. So I keep the marginal distribution in the x direction and the y direction fixed, and I break the association. Implicitly, the null hypothesis that I'm testing is association between the two variables, and the null hypothesis is that there is no association. Right. So there's no relationship between the two variables. The alternative is that there is some association. I'm not saying what, just that it's, it's, there's some association. Um, by, so that you also do need the observer to tell you what it is that's triggering the detection. So what's the structure that's triggering the plot being identified from the rest, okay? All right, I think those are the main things for this. <coughs> Let's look at another one. Um, this is the temperature <coughs> versus the rest, and the um, mechanism's the same. So your job again is pick the one that's the most different from the others. That's fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and why do you say 19? Why do you say because of the negative association? Okay. So let's check it. Yes, and you're correct. That's the true data. Let's look at another one. C 
So this is the ozone versus mortality. Pick the one that's different. I guess it's harder. <coughs> okay, you've got to give me some answers. <laughs> 19. Uh, why do you say 19? These ones? all slightly lower. Okay, so mostly a, a blob here and some points slightly lower. Okay. Um, give me an... 13. 13. It has a comb shape, but it tends to go uh, up, uh, more uh, ozone, more deaths. Okay, so you're saying there's a little bit of association there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, give me another one, if you picked a different one. Or have I covered everything? Maybe there aren't different. Maybe what? There aren't different. Yeah. I mean, obviously the reaction that you're all laughing, this not as, it's not as different as um, the other ones, that the other two that we've seen. Okay, let's check. Thirteen. So you were correct. Yeah. Okay. So we had uh, we had two possibilities within the group. Um, in in practice, I don't know how many people, but you you would get a group of people individually. You'd have a number of people, um, and if if only those two were picked, or if 13 was picked uh, at least some of the time, that's still some evidence against the null hypothesis. You don't actually need too many people to pick that particular plot. As, yeah, so the, the numbers come up pretty easily. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you say, I can't see a graph, that's a possible answer? No, we force people to pick. Okay. Yeah, at this point, um, we are expecting that you pick <coughs> one plot. Um, and, and so that guarantees that we get something, some answer. Um, because if we didn't, I think that would change our calculations dramatically. Uh, we've just done, one of the graduate students has done, um, has some ways to work out if people want to pick more than one then they can pick more than one. Um, and I think that's a good idea generally because if we're sampling from the null and we happen to get extremes on that in the null distribution, this allows us to sort of get a better gauge of those by having them, if people want to pick more than one because there are a couple of that are quite different from everything else, they can do that. So, but we still, yeah, we still force people to pick one even if it's a tough problem. So, yeah. Uh, say that again. Yeah, with 20, 20 plots, then our um, type 1 error is 5%. Yeah. Um, no, uh, it's different because the 1 over m is the probability of um, accidentally picking that plot and so it the number of people factors in in terms of the um, the, the the n in the binomial distribution yeah no yeah
With one observer, one, two, you have a type 1 error of 5%. Yeah, with one observer. But you can't calculate the power if you have just one observer. Exactly. You, you're exactly spot on. So in order to, to calculate the power of the test, you do need multiple observers. Yeah. And it's pretty interesting. And, and there definitely are differences from one person to another um, in, in reading plots. Um, when I ran this myself last night, I thought that ozone had no relationship. And then I could see it. I could see this one is different. It's very small, but it's, it's this part here that caught my attention, that it's kind of empty in here. So it's a very slight difference. So. So I thought that I had something that was a really hard case, that there was no difference to show you, but I'm not sure that I do, that the relationship between the mortality and these pollution variables and also the temperature seems really strong. Let's do one more. Pick the one that's different. Nine. That was fast. <laughs> okay, let's check. Oh, I should ask, so why? Why is nine different? Because Sort of empty here and fairly um, condensed there. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and you're correct. Okay, so I think what this suggests with the um, mortality data is that quite a few of these pollutants do have some association with the mortality, even though they're kind of weak. Um, which I think was interesting because I certainly didn't see that originally, um, the data. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, uh, and what are the, uh, the, the formal tests yeah. compared with these uh, um, Yeah, actually, exactly right. So that JAZA paper was um, a comparison with, uh, with formal tests, mm -hmm. which is not the place where this is designed to be used. But uh, it, it, it uses um, the regression setting um, and tests whether a categorical covariate is important or not. It's one um, experiment. Another experiment is whether the slope is non-zero. So it's like these ones, only we have a slope um, regression line as well. And then a third experiment where you've got contaminated data, where the traditional test won't work at all, where you've got some um, this random scatter of points and a, um, a cluster of points that leads to you, you to believe there's a relationship. So in that experiment, let me show you those and I'll come back to the slides again in a moment. Here we go. Ah. I think that's okay. You can see the rough outline. Um, these, are, these are the experiment. This is one of the experiments that was comparison between the visual inference versus the classical test. And all of these are done with Amazon Turk. How many people have heard of Amazon Turk? Anybody? No. So Amazon runs a service, and it's, yeah, the name's it's got an interesting reason. Um, but basically, you can post jobs on that service, and people sign up as workers to do the job. And so what we did was post uh, lineups 
and people would sign up to um, evaluate them for us to, to answer the question. So we'd put a question of the scatter plots, which of the one sh shows data that has the steepest slope. Because we're comparing this directly against uh, the test, we need to be very specific with our question that we ask. Um, and so we're particularly asked them to evaluate the slope. And you pay people like 10 cents per evaluation. Um, it's used for all sorts of purposes. It's a very heavily um, used service. Um, one of the most recent applications was getting people to detect whether a review for a hotel was a real review or a fake review. Right, so a lot of sites like um, TripAdvisor and um, other travel sites allow you to rate or um, make comments about hotels. But hotels pay people to make reviews. Um, and so Amazon Turk was used uh, by making some selections of real reviews and uh, fake reviews and ask people to read them and say, does this sound real or not to you? Right. And they had a pretty good, um, they, they developed a good model for detecting fake reviews from it. Um, it's used by consumer um, advertising, often to put whether people will respond to this way of laying out the ad advertisement or another way. Uh, very heavily used. The, the, name, um, the name is fun, right? So it's Amazon Turk, and it's derived from a, a, what was called Mechanical Turk. Um, there was another name for it. Um, but have you heard about that famous chess playing machine back in the 1500s? Has anyone heard of the Mechanical Turk? Um, Rolio has, yeah, and so do you want, you want to explain that one too? So there was... It was a fake. It was a big scam. So these guys uh, would car take this machine to different towns across Europe and say, we have this machine that can play chess better than your best chess player. Come play us. Um, and yeah, people would pay lots of money and bet that um, the, their local player would beat the machine. Um, but the machine almost invariably won, won a lot, I think. Um, but it was finally exposed as a scam because there was a man inside the machine that was pulling the levers. So, you know, now a machine can play chess better than most people, but then it couldn't. But that was a, that's the name behind Amazon's Turk, is jobs where people can do better than machines, you post them there. Right, and so evaluating graphics, I think we can still do better than any machine. Oh, it's very difficult for a machine to do that. So this is the one of the experiments where we used it to um, compare with the t-test. And the results are amazingly good. People, so we generated a lot of simulated data, um, had a lot of different lineups to be evaluated, different slopes, different variances, different sample sizes. And the results uh, match the classical test very closely. Actually, very, very closely. So it, that, I mean, that tells us that I think this is a pretty good mechanism. The other thing that we learned is that there are some people that do better than the classical test. So there are a few people that have got eyes that are so sharp. They can pick things out um, that are really tight, small. Um, so that's one. Here's another. <coughs> so this is looking at residuals for uh, uh, hierarchical models are so very difficult to evaluate hierarchical models and so we were looking use this to test um, residuals from different types of model structures um, this one was looking at um, similar to the side by side dot plots actually yeah this was a plot design um, instead of side by side dot plots overlay two density plots 
Um, in addition, so we had about four different plot designs for the, instead of the side-by-side -side dots. We had uh, histograms, we had densities, and I think we had box plots. And we had different sample sizes. And that actually helped us work out, it, the interesting thing is that um, when you want to compare two groups, uh, the side-by-side -side box plot is absolutely the best, as long as the data size is not small. But if you've got small sample sizes of five, ten points, you need to use dot plots, and then people can do better at picking them out. So it helps decide what type of plot would be better for a particular situation. And this one was another one like that. Um, so this is another experiment um, to compare um, whether a circular design or a Euclidean design was better. So these are circular sort of density plots, uh, sort of like histograms for showing the percentiles of a um, particular thing. I'm pointing this one because this one's actually the data and you can kind of see something a little bit different with that, I think, that there's this um, darkening here in a particular direction. So the, the concentric, it's sort of concentric circles, but they're giving how much uh, within what the 10th percentile, 20th percentile, 50th percentile. So the colour represents the percentiles. The alternative design was just a box plot. So, in, so it's just straight box plot. Um, and it was really a, a pl plot designed to examine wind direction. So they were looking at airports and whether air wind direction created, when they had winds from particular directions, whether there were more delays in the flights. And so it made sense to use polar coordinates for that because then we can get the sense for if the wind's coming from this direction, then my, I've got more delays from there. Um, it turned out, and this is a really interesting experiment because the Euclidean coordinates beats polar, hands down. People do twice as well with bar charts than with this circular design. The um, interesting aside to that work is that with the bar charts, people were more accurate but less confident. So we also asked them, how confident are you in your answer? And so with the bar charts, they were accurate and not so confident. With the polar coordinates, they were not so accurate, but they were so confident. So they were so sure that they were right, but they were wrong. And that's really, I don't know, that's, that surprised us <laughs> enormously. Um, and I don't know why, but you see pie charts have uh, stayed in use for a long time, um, even though people have shown before that bar charts are better but still people do pie charts. Somehow I think people like circles. Circles are more aesthetic. I don't know, but anyway, the interplay between accuracy and, and confidence was um, very surprising. Okay, I think those are the main pieces there. <coughs> Right, so you remember that scatter plot at the beginning with the WASP data. I'm going to show you a lineup of the WASP data. Well, I have to say I changed the data, so it's not quite the same. Um, but I want you to pick out the plot of the WASPs, or really you could think about just pick out the plot where the groups are the most separated. So lineup of the WASP data. Um, which plot has the groups that are the most separated? Two? Two, three, four? Any more? Okay. Um, 
That is the data. Actually, it is exactly the WASP data that you saw in the first slide. But even though you've seen it, you didn't pick it. OK, let me tell you the mechanism. <coughs> so very similar as before, I have four classes, four labels. And I permute those labels. So if a WASP was F, really, it might have been assigned W. So the labels got permuted. And then I rerun linear discrimination analysis. Right, so linear discrimination analysis is rerun on the fake labels, on the wrong labels. And these are the results. So each one of these, I've permuted the labels, redone LDA. And this is the best separation of the two. Right. They are very distinct groups. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some. Uh, these two species share something. Maybe you can turn it around, like you're saying. So, just by random chance, you get a big difference between the groups. You might be able to say, well, actually, in practice, they're closer than that. But it, it really, what this tells you is that any separation that you saw in here is not real because uh, random assignment of the WASP species label gives you more separation. So there just is no difference between the WASPs. Maybe there are three groups instead of four. Maybe. OK, so you could, do, you could redo the groups then, so maybe combine this, these two groups and then rerun your permutations and rerun the lineups. I think the problem is more um, uh, more organized than that. So it's just simply oh yeah. yeah well, well I just talk about the results by putting things up on Amazon Turk. <coughs> Um, we showed uh, that lineup and we generated um, four more lineups that had different null plots in them. So that you got four different, five different arrangements of lineups that have got different null plot comparisons. And those were our real data. And then we generated lineups that were all noise. So every single one was a random um, plot. And <laughs> the results were that um, nobody with the true data correctly uh, picked the true data. So nobody actually picked the plot of the WASPs as the most separated. So yeah, p-value exactly one. And the noise data, amazingly one of the lineups with the noise data, there was something funny about our fake real plot and people picked that one. And so the fake data actually had a smaller p-value. That, no, that happens by chance. Um, just from one of the lineups. Yeah. Okay, so how does that happen? Um, we're dealing with a lot of high dimensional small sample size data these days. And it just is that when you have uh, high dimensions and small sample size, there's a lot of ways to re rearrange that data where you've got gaps between them. Okay, so with high dimensions, it's sparse. And it's very easy to find some sort of plane in that high dimensional space where the groups are separated. And that's all that's happening here. So you're running a conventional statistical method on a high dimension small sample size. It's finding separations. That doesn't mean that it's real separations. It just means that the separation is there because you've got the high dimensions. Um, and so that was uh, in a published paper that it was um, a result that said, hey, these wasps really are different. But they're not different. Um, it ha happens to be one of our colleagues at, at Iowa State University. So she's an author on the paper that describes why this is not a good result. But the rest of the paper had more stuff, so it, wasn't, it didn't invalidate the whole paper. Um, but just in general with the high dimensions, um, we do have these issues in terms of uh, sparsity 
and any, any sort of structure that you might want to find, you possibly could find. But you need to have some mechanisms for understanding whether it's real or not. Okay. Now we're finishing early today, so I didn't have a break because I'm pretty much done. Um, so basically, in summary, I think we have a way to quantify the findings that we make from graphics now. Um, and it's the pretty strong results. So this is the paper that explains all the details of how you would make calculations and how it compares with the conventional testing. Um, we've been using it with real data. We've been using it with some of this high throughput sequencing data to get some sense whether there's any structure at all in the data. Um, we've also been using it to choose plot designs. So we have particular presentations we want to make and um, we want to know whether making a plot one way versus another way will help the, re help the audience pick up the information better. So those are the two things. Um, I think that's it. So yeah, I just want to say thank you for listening these last three days. And I hope you've had a chance to write in the book um, that I sent around. And if you if, uh, feel free to contact me with information or questions or um, examples or your own work and yeah, thank you. <laughs>